Uganda is a land of great natural beauty, but also of many challenges. Because electricity, transportation, and refrigeration can be unreliable, it is difficult to deliver delicate vaccines to remote villages. As a result, thousands of children face the possibility of devastating preventable diseases like measles, polio, and tuberculosis. Last year, all of that began to change. That's when, as part of its work to optimize community healthcare supply chains, the UPS Foundation formed an extraordinary public-private partnership connecting its longtime partner Gavi and the Ugandan Ministry of Health with the UPS Ismia team and our authorized service contractor, FIT. With each member contributing its expertise, funding and dedication to a cutting-edge supply chain pilot across three districts in Uganda, the team set out to provide children access to safe, effective vaccines. There has been a dramatic difference in just months. Routes are efficiently planned. New temperature control units and the fuel to power them have been installed along the supply chain. And data is being recorded and delivered in real time to the Ministry of Health to manage inventory. This unique private-public partnership has improved the public health system through an end-to-end -end visibility system, sustainable and timely vaccine distribution. Please welcome Anne Romatowski, Vice President, Global Philanthropy, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Rachel Schneider, Omidyar Network Entrepreneur-in-Residence Financial Security Program, the Aspen Institute. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce Foundation for putting the, on this exceptional event, bringing us all together today. And I in particular want to thank them for their leadership in highlighting opportunities for industry and other stakeholders to really invest in building financial security of vulnerable communities. So my name is Ann Romatowski. I'm with J.P. Morgan Chase, where I focus on financial health and financial security through our philanthropic work and across our lines of business. And I'm really delighted to be here today with Rachel Schneider. Rachel has a distinguished career in research around the financial lives of vulnerable communities across the United States, um, and also really has a, a compelling way of translating all of her research into actionable opportunities that uh, corporations, government leaders, philanthropists, and other stakeholders can take to help address that financial insecurity. So um, one of the things that I want to note that we'll be talking about a little bit in this session um, is a, a book that Rachel co-authored called The Financial Diaries um, that's really an extraordinary deep dive into the financial behaviors of families across the U.S. Um, it shows an incredibly, incredibly high level of ingenuity, but also a lot of opportunities where systems can really do better. Um, and it's also just a really engaging read, so I encourage all of you to check that out. So for this session, we're going to be talking about financial well-being, income volatility, and economic resilience for vulnerable individuals. And then we're going to talk about how disasters can sometimes exacerbate an already precarious situation. So I don't have to tell this audience that when it comes to disasters, everybody is exposed. But as we've heard already today, low-income and vulnerable communities tend to have a harder time withstanding and then recovering from disasters when they do come up. So before we dive into disasters, specifically, Rachel, I thought it would be helpful to hear more about how families deal with uncertainty on a day-to-day -day basis and the systems that they use to create personal resilience. So can you tell us a little bit about your findings on that? Sure, so I'd also like to um, second your thanks um, to the Chamber of Commerce Foundation, and also to all of you for spending your time on this. It's really um, been an interesting session so far for me, and so I'm really glad to be here. Um, as Anne mentioned, my work um, on the Financial Diaries Project was really a deep dive into the financial lives of families. And so what my co-author, Jonathan Mordock, who's a professor at NYU, and I did is we led a team of researchers and we worked closely with 235 families across the country to understand every dollar that came in and out of their homes. So for a full year, we had field researchers who were out talking to these families and gathering data about how they spent, saved, earned, um, gave money away, borrowed. I mean, we tried to log it if they, you know, 
were given a free couch by a relative. Right? We really wanted to understand the depths of people's financial experience and the depths of their lives. And what emerged from that work was really a story of volatility, a story of how uncertain people's money is from month to month or from week to week. And a, a big part of that story is stuff you know intuitively, right? Expenses are just inherently lumpy. Like you, right, Christmas comes when it comes, the beginning of the school year comes when it comes, roofs break, cars break, right, stuff happens. What was less well understood was the extent to which people's income also really goes up and down throughout the year. So if you're me, right, I haven't really lived that experience. I've had mostly salaried jobs most of my life. There's a bonus at the end of the year, hopefully, right? But there's a great deal of steadiness. But for a lot of the workforce, that's not the case at all. So if you work hourly, there's ups and downs week to week. If you work on commission, there's ups and downs week to week. If you um, have a baseline salary but depend on overtime, then there's ups and downs week to week. And so what you see when you look at the bottom part of the income distribution in this country is that not only are people's wages um, lower and they have been stagnant for several decades, relative to the rising cost of living, but you also see that month to month, people really don't know how much they're gonna earn. And when you lay that against the you know, ups and downs of spending, it's just an incredibly challenging project for people to understand what is my money gonna look like next week. And so um, the, when we think about financial resilience, we often wanna go first to budgeting, let's help people budget. But it's important to come to that question understanding that people's experience is just incredibly variable over time. And so the budgeting analysis you're hoping people will do is actually really complicated. I think that that's a really important point. And I think for, for so long, there have been a lot of uh, programs out there that are very well intentioned that are, uh, you know, promoting concepts like budgeting um, or sort of broad-based financial literacy campaigns with the assumption that if people just knew a little bit more about how to manage their money, they would be able to overcome some of these hurdles. But what your research has really shown is that of these 235 families that you looked into really in depth, a lot of them were very, very savvy and very, very sophisticated about their finances, managing lots of complex inflows and outflows um, and really being, being sophisticated there um, and, and thinking about savings in really interesting ways. Yeah. So in the face of all of this volatility, what does it actually mean to save and to save successfully? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, a lot of people have probably heard the statistic that the Federal Reserve is responsible for, which is that approximately 40% of Americans cannot easily pay for a $400 expense if it were to come up. And that statistic is kind of shocking. And you're, you're, the immediate response to that usually for people is, well, how do we help people to save more? So if what's happening is that families don't have $400 on hand when something comes up, then how do we help them save that money? And in fact, there's you know, a, a um, several decades old field that both Ann and I are, um, would probably consider ourselves to be part of around how to help people build assets and wealth. And that field, we've really invested a ton of effort into thinking about how to help people save. And, but what we saw when we looked at people's lives over the course of a full year is it's not that people aren't saving. They're saving on a regular basis. It's just that they're saving and then spending that savings, and saving and then spending that savings over and over and over. So what you see are incredible inflows and outflows within a savings account. And so, as Anne sort of pointing to, it's not that people don't know. I mean, we asked the question of, um, as part of our ongoing survey co data collection in the diaries, we asked people, how much money do you think you should have set aside? People know the benchmarks, they know what amount um, financial literacy experts or budgeting experts or financial advisors say they should have. There's not a huge knowledge gap there. And there's not even a huge behavior gap. What's happening is that people, something comes up and people spend that money. Um, and in fact, that, like, that's what we should see, right? That's, that's not a bad thing. That's people using the savings for what it was intended, which is to deal with some upcoming expense. And you know, one of the things that we saw is that people are, um, as Anne was referencing, incredibly creative about how to save. Because saving in cash in a savings account is 
it can be hard. It can be, it can be hard to not then spend that money on things that you don't necessarily need. So we had um, one family we talk about a lot who we, um, she put her um, money, like she had multiple accounts. So she had a, a checking account basically that she used for bill payment and other things locally. She put her savings in a credit union that was an hour drive away, had terrible hours. And she cut up her debit card so she couldn't access that savings. Right? And so what she said is that way I will only say I'll only access that money for really, really needs, is how she talked about it. So you know, it, like the need for that money had to rise to the level of I'm willing to drive out there at a time that's a pain. And we saw all kinds of variations on that. We had another um, person who talked about putting all of his money with his mom. He said, my mom's like Fort Knox, you know, <laughs> like I can't get it. You know, he, on the other hand, like he knew he could get it if he really needed it, but he couldn't get it easily. And so there is work we can do around helping people to meet their savings objectives, but we should approach that work understanding that people are, they're saving and they're working hard at it. They're just external constraints around how much money they'll actually accumulate in those accounts. Yeah, I think that this is a great point. And it, it reminds me of some work um, out of an organization called Earn and their Saver Life platform. It's an online platform where individuals can link in a checking account or a savings account, set a savings goal, receive some um, you know, nudges and other information from a community of savers like them. And then as long as they sort of save consistently over the course of a few months, they're entered in to win prizes for savings um, and in some cases receive receive uh, small matches for the amount that they're able to save. Um, and it, they have remarkable success rates uh, with a population that has a fairly low income. I believe that the, the median income of their participants is about $25,000 a year. Um, and so it really challenges this notion that low income people can't save, um, but that I, th I think you know, it's just one example of uh, a situation in which low-income people with the right access to products um, and encouragement and goal, you know, an ability to set their goals um, and reach towards them can and will save. Uh, so J.P. Morgan Chase has partnered with Saber Life in Houston um, to work with a number of community-based organizations there to help people set a savings goal around being prepared for a disaster. Um, hopefully we won't see the next Harvey anytime soon, um, but the reality of that event really hit that community. And so um, br being able to bring in this, this product, this tool um, to help people name an objective um, around preparedness and to set some money aside there has been really powerful for the community. Um, so, Rachel, you mentioned that sort of savings is important, but we know that it's not uh, the whole piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some other tactics that you've seen people use to build financial resilience? So a huge piece that goes sort of under-acknowledged is about connection with community. So um, early on in the diaries, um, one of the things we did is write a series of profiles about individual households. And one of the first profiles that we wrote was about a woman that we renamed Rita, right? We covered, we, oh, we're always changing some details about people's lives in order to protect their anonymity. And Rita's way of getting through the month was um, she, so the whole, the whole month people would be asking her for stuff, right? Somebody would sleep on her couch, somebody else would come over for dinner, somebody else needed help paying a bill, and she was always saying yes. And then at the end of the month, when she was short, she went back to all those same people. And they all helped her. And from a purely financial advice, for, like from a, you know, if you're a personal financial advisor, that feels kind of odd. Like it feels like, well, you know, if Rita hadn't shared with the other people earlier in the month, she wouldn't have needed to go to anyone else later in the month. She just would have had what she needed. But the reality is that that interconnection is a huge part of the value for her of her life, that ongoing give and take and that feeling of connectedness and all the people she relied on and who relied on her is what gave her life meaning and purpose. And, you know, strangely, like the silver lining, like disaster, disaster recovery is always sort of awful. And yet you always hear these stories, right? You always hear the stories of how and why people helped each other. 
Um, so I do think that's an important piece of financial resilience planning itself um, as part of why I was so intrigued by the existence of employer hardship funds um, or employer relief funds. But I, because I think we do have this natural instinct to band together and take care of each other. And I think that strategy deserves really lifting up and acknowledging as a strategy. It is a, it should be, it is a part of people's financial planning and it should be, it deserves to be. That's great. So I'd love to spend a little bit more time on that last piece that you mentioned, employer mm -hmm. hardship funds. Yeah. And I love the tie into community because a lot of people do consider their workplace and their colleagues part of their community. Yeah. Um, so you've done some research on the existence of these funds. We've already heard a little bit today about the great work that the chamber is doing um, on the employee assistance funds. Can you talk a little bit more about the research that you've done on employee hardship funds, what's out there, what it looks like, and what some of the promising practices are? Sure, um, I'm happy to. So last year, um, the Walmart Foundation provided a grant to the Aspen Institute and Commonwealth, which is um, a nonprofit based in Boston. And we went in and tried to understand what is the state of the field uh, among employer relief funds. And so we interviewed um, some of the largest funds and some of the third party fund providers. And we also did research with beneficiaries. So we um, did in-depth interviews with, I want to say like 15 beneficiaries and we did a survey with almost 200. And we also then did some focus groups to understand what people who hadn't experienced the hardship fund thought about them. And I have to say, I was a bit surprised by it. Um, because my bias going in was that what matters most is the financial health outcome, right? If people have been given um, a grant of some kind because something has gone wrong in their lives and now they have, a gr have been received a grant, then because of like, the work that I've done in the world, I thought the most important metric for success is what does the financial life of that person look like afterwards? And, um, and I should clarify that what we were interested in, in particular, was not only the funds that, ha that exist to help employees after a disaster, but also the funds, we had a speci specific interest in the funds that have defined their scope of work more broadly, and also cover all kinds of personal hardships. And part of why we thought that was so important was that, you know, based on this story that I'm telling about the financial fragility of many American households, if we wanna think about how to help people post a disaster, we have to think more broadly about their financial lives in general, right? We have to be able to build resilience in general in ways that I think are very consistent with how I heard um, some of the prior speakers talking about preparedness. Part of the preparedness is what is the financial well-being of employees, civilian citizens, in able to weather a shock later? So we were particularly looking at the funds that have expanded their brought their focus so that they can help people with a wide range of challenges that they might feel. And so my lens was really, all right, so you helped somebody with this challenge, then what is their financial well-being? What I didn't anticipate was how strongly the building of community was a part of why people valued the funds, right? That people valued being able to be a donor just as highly as people who were recipients valued the ability to get that money on the back end which I found really compelling. And, and it does go back to, I think, this sense that we need to invest heavily in community and that when you do, people really respond and appreciate that. That's great. So, Rachel, I've heard you talk before about this question about employee hardship funds and the question of, you know, if you're going to make, give an opportunity to an employee to apply for $1,000 in the case of an emergency, why not just increase pay by $20 yeah. or $50 every paycheck. What's the, what's the difference there in terms of impact? Yeah, I'm glad you're asking that. And in part, because I feel like there's all sorts of additional financial interventions we should be talking about that this question goes to. Um, so um, having a lump sum of money at one time is not the same as having a little bit more money all the time. It's just not. It doesn't operate the same in people's lives. And when you ask people, um, um, 
like I, I want to go in multiple directions with that. It doesn't operate in the same in the same way because even, like if you imagine a thousand dollars, that basically equates to getting an additional twenty dollars in your paycheck every two weeks. Well, that amount is going to be good. You're going to appreciate it, but it is not necessarily going to accrue to any accumulated amount. And yet, you're still going to have those moments when you need a lump sum because something has happened in your life. So the Pew Charitable Trust did research looking at the magnitude and, um, and frequency of economic shocks. And in a given year, you can expect that about 60% of people, of households in the country, will experience some kind of an economic shock that requires them to come up with some lump sum. So the, when you put that, context, put that in context, right, 60% of people are going to experience something where they need a lump sum. 40% of people do not have $400 easily available. And that starts to tell you like the opportunity to get $1,000 when you need it or $500 when you need it, it is different than having a little bit more money all the time. Now they both matter and we should be worried about wages. And one of the things that surfaced from our hardship fund um, research was that um, hardship funds were far more likely to result in people saying yes, this money allowed me to get to my back to my pre-hardship fund condition when they also had strong wages and benefits supporting them. Right, so there's no way in which a thousand, access to $1,000 occasionally takes the place of wages. They both matter, but I think we need to understand that they both matter and we need more interventions in the world that, that acknowledge the value of both of those ways of receiving money. That's great. So we are running up on time, um, so unfortunately we don't have time for Q&A, but we are going to continue the themes of this conversation in a breakout session this afternoon on vulnerable communities. Um, so welcome all of you to join us here, and please join me in thanking Rachel. Oh, and thanking Anne. <laughs>
and NORAD is a binational command with Canada. That's important to note just because of the nature of what we are, our responsibility from NORAD extends uh, with our Canadian partners, and I report just as much to the Prime Minister as I do to the President with respect to the NORAD responsibilities. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, I'll kind of give you an idea of some of the things that we do. First thing I'd say is every day, 24-7, 365, we have the airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, and civilians of NORTHCOM and NORAD are on alert, ready to respond to whatever happens. That can be something such as a terrorist attack. It could be something like a hijacking that we saw in 9-11. Uh, it could be something like a Russian long-range aviation that we see sometimes flying through the Arctic. Uh, it could be things that you see on the, on the slide there where there's a big event, whether it be the Super Bowl, whether it be an inauguration, we provide some protection, whether it be airborne caps, uh, all the way to protection against counter UASs. We look at some of the things that are happening uh, within, our, within our nation on any given day. Uh, we are always prepared to respond, whether it's a chemical, a biological, or radio, radiological, or nuclear event, to be able to respond. And so it's a pretty wide spectrum of things that we're able to respond to on any given day. But we also provide protection for the president. We provide protection for the national capital region here. Uh, and we're also standing by at any moment to respond to a natural disaster. That can be some of the things that you've seen, certainly highlighted some of the TTXs that you've done, but also the real events that we've had just over the last couple of years with some pretty significant hurricanes that have hit the United States. And we, we are postured to respond. We're not the lead federal agency in that, and that's an important piece to remember, is that we're partnered with FEMA. And in the end, there's a response, it really starts at the local level, then it goes to local communities, to the state level, to include the state National Guard, and then if additional resources are needed at the federal level, then FEMA steps in, and then we are supporting FEMA bringing an excess capability and capacity that we, the Department of Defense, can bring to bear. One of the things worth noting is that we, even though we in Northcom don't own all the assets that might need to come to bear, we're what we call the DOD synchronizer. So we take all of the assets that might be within the Department of Defense and we're able to apply that. That way, people don't have to go to five or six different agencies that might have the capability capacity that they need. They can go right to us as Northcom and we can make sure that right capability capacity gets to the right spot at the right time. And so within that role of the DOD synchronizer, we've had very good success in supporting FEMA, supporting the states, and ultimately supporting our, supporting our response to natural disasters like hurricanes. But we're also considered other natural disasters like the wildfires, and we provide support to them as well. And we're prepared to maybe, for example, if there was an earthquake of a large magnitude, we're prepared to be able to respond to those type of events as well. Now, as we go into more nefarious actors, we find that the security environment that we're in today is much, much different than it was just a few years ago. When we look at some of the Russian capability, look at some of the Chinese capabilities, certainly when we watch North Korea, watch what's happening in Iran today, we find that these actions that are happening globally can now impact us at home much more than they might have been able to just a few years ago. And so, of course, we're actively on defense against them as well. We run the ballistic missile defense. So, if, for example, if North Korea was able to launch a missile, we'd be able to take that missile out before it would be able to hit the United States. We're able to respond if the Russians, when they fly their long-range aviation, if they fly, if they sortie out a, for example, the Gorshkov was just a, uh, recently out here as a frigate that they sailed into close to our territory that we were able to respond to. Uh, whatever the nature of the, of the potential threat might be, we're able to respond to that. But what we find is that we look at going into what the future might bring, we have to be able to respond to that full spectrum, whether it be a wildfire, whether it be a hurricane, whether it be an earthquake, or whether it was a, uh, maybe a, one of our adversaries that would actually try to cause us harm here in the United States or Canada, we need to be able to respond to that as well. And what we find is the actual structure that we use for the hurricanes, as an example, is the same response structure that would work very well if we had a nefarious actor that caused some sort of a challenging situation here in the, in, in the United States. And so we found that when we apply that same template, we're able to bring to bear that federal capability from the Department of Defense all the way down to the local level. Slide. So let's talk a little bit about the lens that I look through and where I get my guidance. The good news is we have very clear guidance all the way from the national security strategy that talks to us about having a culture of preparedness. It talks about building that resiliency. And that applies to the Department of Defense just like it applies to every agency within the interagency and the government, as well as all the way down to the local level. And so we take that guidance very, very seriously. And then we look at, as we've done responses to things like hurricanes, 
one of the things we find is there's such a big difference if the local level response is prepared, that the overall response works so much better because of that local capability that's there becomes so critically important. And so it's not just having that federal capability that's important, it's really that local level, that state, local community level, the state level, and then the federal level that all has to come together in a collaborative way. And a big part of that is understanding who it is that we're gonna be working with. And that's why I think in events like this where you're actually getting to know each other, doing some of the, the tabletop exercises like you were able to do this morning, you're exchanging business cards because the first time you talk to somebody doesn't want, you don't want that to be uh, an immediate response to, a, to, an accident, to an incident or a catastrophic event. You want to build those relationships early and you want to have that Rolodex well-defined of who it is that we need to call and who it is that we need to partner with. And I think we get that guidance very clearly in some of the directions that we've been given. And then clearly from my perspective, our number one priority is protection of the homeland. And it's a sacred responsibility that we take very seriously, and that's why we are an alert 24-7, 365, and we are positive to respond to whatever the future might bring, and we take that incredibly seriously. And then, well, at the end of the day, we have this military capability, and so we want to make sure what we're bringing to bear is actually going to be helpful to the problem. And so whether it's, a, again, a natural disaster or whether it's a nefarious event, we want to make sure the capability that we are bringing to bear is going to be part of that solution set. Slide. One of the things that I found that since I've been in the job now about 14 months is you cannot separate homeland defense and homeland security. And so tomorrow I know you're gonna hear from the Department of Homeland Security, but I will tell you, I actually meet with the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security more than I meet with the Secretary of Defense. And it's because you just can't separate what we do from the Department of Defense standpoint and what the Department of Homeland Security does when it comes to homeland defense and homeland security. And I looked, when I look at what we're focused on in defending our critical infrastructure as a nation, I can't just look at it from a DOD standpoint. I can't just go look at the installations that are clearly important for the Department of Defense. Because our Department of Defense is equally dependent on the national infrastructure as everybody else is. And so the lens that we look through is really the national critical infrastructure, not the Department of Defense critical infrastructure. And so that brings us together with the Department of Homeland Security. We're partnered with them and things that all the organizations, the sub-organizations that they have, and we are all the way from our, uh, our youngest uh, uh, action officers all the way up to myself, we are on a daily basis uh, intersecting with the Department of Homeland Security and all the sub-organizations within those. That becomes critically important as we look into the future and figure out how are we gonna be prepared to respond because we always respond as, as an interagency. We don't respond just as one organization, we respond together. And so that collaborative nature of the work that we're doing, the tying not just in, in catastrophic, not just following catastrophic events, but that tie-in that we have every single day with the Department of Home and Security partners becomes critically important. And we also find that we can, same, we can use the same models that we use for the hurricanes for that nefarious actor, and the example that I use was the elections in 2018. As we looked at and approached those elections, it's important to remember that the election system you know, starts at the state level and it pushes up into the federal system. And so we had to figure out how do we apply some of our cyber capability within the Department of Defense in order to help Department of Homeland Security and Sec then Secretary Nielsen as she went to make sure that we had uh, fair elections that weren't manipulated by any foreign entity. And so as we were able to, as we looked at that, we just used, we said we should just use the hurricane model and look at the defense support to civil authorities that worked so well during a hurricane and we're able to provide federal capability down to the state level. And so what we did, we took some of the expertise that resides in Cyber Command under Paul Nakasone. We brought together the state National Guard leadership. We brought them all together within our headquarters. We were able to provide some high level security briefings, some understanding of what the threat actually was. We were able to provide some capability and capacity in both sensors uh, as, as well as uh, understanding of what they should be looking for. And then all of those guard members went back out to their states and were able to have that capability dispersed across the U.S. in the, in the defense sports civil authorities model that we use for the hurricanes and we were able to provide the appropriate support for the elections and we'll use that going forward again. But again, that's just an example of the way we were prepared to respond to whether it's a cyber event uh, or whether it's a natural disaster. Slide, please. One of the things that I find is that it used to be the Department of Defense led the way on technological development, and we still do in some areas, 
But more and more, we're counting on the commercial world. And more and more, the research and development that we spend as a nation is being done by the commercial entities, not just by the Department of Defense. And so for all of you out there that represent com companies that have done some great investment, we're looking to partner with you and find ways that we can leverage your advancements to help our cause, not only in the broader Department of Defense efforts, but also specifically as we apply that capability here in the homeland. Some examples that we're seeing already is some of the work that we're doing on the communication side of the house. Uh, I use it as an example. I used to be a commander of our Air Operations Center in Hawaii a long time ago when I was a colonel. And when I would bring my counterparts in from the civilian side, they would just be amazed at our capability, amazed at our domain awareness, amazed at the, the computers and the screens and everything that we had. Now when I fast forward and I bring those same type people into our command centers now, they're equally amazed. But it's not in a good way, right? <laughs> it's like, that's what you got? And it's, it's not so much that we have an advanced, because we have. We have some great systems. But the commercial world has just leapt forward. And they've gone at a pace that we have not been able to do within our own command and control structures within the military. And so I look at it, United Airlines, I'm not picking on United Airlines, I just use that as a great example. You could use any, any of the multiple type command centers that, that are uh, proliferated out there. The, the ability to command and control, different, different mission set for sure, same concept, that is now happening within the commercial world is something that we need to be able to leverage. And the same thing applies to response to events that happens. How do, we, how do we have our command and control of our own infrastructure? How do we understand our rail systems? How do we understand our power systems? How do we understand what is happening, our domain awareness within those systems? How do we actually push that to the right people so that they can respond? And then as we look at other ways we can really leverage, for example, I'll look at the commercialization of space and how that rapid reduction in the cost of the access to space is fundamentally changing the way that we're going to communicate in the future, the way our data might flow in the future, the proliferation of LEO as an example, whether it be a OneWeb or, or a SpaceX and the efforts that they're doing, are going to fundamentally change the way that we communicate. And we have to embrace that, not only within the Department of Defense for pure military activities, but all of us together in how we're going to respond to events that happen here in the U.S. And I'm, there's many, many different examples that we could use for that uh, slide. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the national response framework really emphasizes the need for a collaboration, the need for building that resiliency together from the local level to state level to the federal level, and the way that it all has to come together in a way that is effective at that most critical moment that we have. And if applying that same template to all manner of crisis that we might face, to me, is the model going forward that we need to make sure that we continue to do. The exercises like you did this morning in the TTX is the exercises that we do with Department of Homeland Security, the exercises that we do at the state and local level all lead to our resiliency, our culture of preparedness, so that we are able to respond in a manner that's going to be appropriate to the threats that we might face. And when I say threats, I don't just mean nefarious actors. It can be earthquakes, hurricanes, et cetera. And so I think forums like this, of building those partnerships, building that relationship becomes critically important. And we don't do anything together. An example of that I'll show is the next slide if you look at what we do right here in the national capital region. It's a perfect example. We have six million, six million people in the greater Washington metropolitan area. And you think about all the authorities involved in protecting all the things that reside within the national capital region from clearly the president and, and, and the White House, the Capitol Hill. You have the Capitol Police. You have the Pentagon. We have our own police force within the Pentagon. We have multiple DOD installations. We have, of course, the, the Washington uh, Police Force. We have the Secret Service. We have an amazing number of folks here to include an international airport operating. And it all has to come together seamlessly. And this is yet another example of how we have to work together. And we have to be prepared to respond in whatever the future might be in ways that allow us to do so in unison and to be able to do so in a productive way so they're not actually fragging each other out or we're not hurting each other's attempts to, to actually get after what the problem is, but we're actually helping each other. 
And so as you look at just the microcosm of here within the national capital region really is a, essentially the same challenge we have just spread out through the broader US. I think it, it inspires us to, 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 to do these events that will drive us together so we understand how we're gonna respond, we understand what the authorities are within each of the organizations and how they all need to come together in order to be productive when we find ourselves in a bad day. And so I would just wrap up by saying, first know that 365, 24 seven, you have a team, a team that is focused on and prepared to respond. That team is focused and prepared to respond to whatever the future will bring. That can include anything from wildfires, earthquakes, to a really bad day when we had some nefarious actor that might do something to harm us here in the United States. But we're prepared either way, we're prepared to respond, we're prepared to work with the local community, we're prepared to work, work with the state authorities, and we're prepared to work within the federal government to make sure that we are able to provide the right resources from the Department of Defense at the right time, at the right place, and do so in a manner that'll allow us ultimately as a nation to respond to whatever the event might happen to be. I think we've, we've done a good job of learning from events that have happened. We've had some fairly significant hurricanes over the last couple of years that have been a good proving ground for some of the things that we're looking to bring forward. But I also know that we can't accurately predict exactly what the future will bring. And so the work that you guys are doing today, the work that you'll continue to do when you leave here, uh, becomes critically important. So I thank you for that. And we, we at Northcom and NORAD want to be a good partner. So if you have good forums that you're aware of that you think we can be helpful for, please invite us to those forums. And please can continue to support these forums where we try to bring in the broader community that needs to come together when we're having a catastrophic event here within the United States. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, General, for those valuable insights uh, towards cooperation in security and defense. Our conference underscores the importance of coordination and collaboration to protect ourselves and our loved ones. So thank you, General, and to U.S. Northern Command for your support uh, in improving the resilience and also in the partnership of this conference.